Thank you. Evening, everyone. Evening. Enjoying the weather outside? <laughs> yes. It's a gorgeous day for October. As she said, my name is Alicia Clark and I'm with the Office of Student Safety and Wellness. You guys may know our office because we're the ones who produce the Students' Rights and Responsibilities book that you receive every year that outlines what the expectations of our <coughs> students are in FCPS and also outlines the consequences for any type of infractions or what is expected of um, everyone in the county. Tonight, I'm here to talk to you about um, bullying, a little bit about cyberbullying as well. Um, my position in the county is I am a ATOT teacher or a prevention teacher. So I have a wealth of knowledge anywhere from alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs to bullying, internet safety, digital citizenship. Um, so I'll be more than happy to come back and speak with you about other topics. But tonight we're just going to focus on bullying. So quick question for you guys. What is your definition of bullying? Or do you remember the definition of bullying from being in high school? No? Okay. Yes? Highly aggressive behavior that's repeated over time that involves an imbalance of power intended to harm, intimidate, or humiliate another person. Okay. So highly aggressive behaviors that are repeated over time intended to harm or intimidate someone and the imbalance of power. Thank you. I was trying to remember, hope I can remember it. Um, so that definition is pretty much the definition that we in FCPS use. Um, this definition is also the definition that the state of Virginia or Department of Education defines. So when we address bullying, we're going to look for the intent to cause harm, the power imbalance, and that is repeated over time. Um, it's important to know is what that person or the aggressor intentions was at that very moment. Was it to manipulate someone? Was it to cause bodily harm or to make that person feel a certain way? Now the power imbalance, we often say, is not necessarily physical strength, but also that social emotional strength or social um, status. Whereas you can't sit at this lunch table with us. Um, the way technology has transformed, it could be you can't be a part of this social or group chat messaging and things of that nature. So the way we see it manifested now is a lot different. And then it's repeated over time. This is important to note because it's a pattern of behavior. This is not a one-time incident towards a particular person. When we talk about the types of bullying, we're looking at, and I think we're all familiar with the two primary, which is physical and emotional. Physical bullying, I think we've all seen in the movies where you're cornering someone in the um, hallway or you are uh, putting them in the trash can or stuffing them in the locker. I think we're familiar with those. Or always trying to fight someone. The emotional piece, a lot of kids will often reference the movie Mean Girls where they create the burn book or they say spreading rumors or saying mean or nasty things about individuals to make them feel a certain way. And now we have the piece of cyberbullying. Now cyberbullying isn't different from bullying, it's just where it takes place. Um, often remind individuals that cyberbullying, that one post can actually be spread multiple times. So if you have a thousand followers on Snapchat, how many people are accessing that information in that given moment? Um, and kids, in addition, whereas these are against the SRN and FCPS, when it comes to cyberbullying, it is actually a class one misdemeanor in the state of Virginia to harass or coerce someone online or say vile things about them. So there's also the opportunity to have a legal consequence associated with that behavior. Now, yes? Um, in your definition of bullying, you know, you called out the three kind of key tenets, and it'll be power imbalance. Mm -hmm. I'm not entirely clear why it's necessary to include the bullet power imbalance, for example. Like what types of interactions does it exclude in the definition by including that? I mean, like that, that you had to have that particular one, because it seems like Intent to cause harm, repeat over time, probably a broader definition. So intent to cause harm, the power and balance, and repeat it over time. It's just that you are trying to intimidate someone in order to have some authority over that person. So when we do the investigations, every time we're looking for these three characteristics, it doesn't mean that all these things have to be present in one investigation. But because it's, so, it's more about the emotional piece associated with that mental bullying, whereas I can't be a part of this social group or I feel this way or I don't have the courage to um, possibly stand up 
or defend myself as well. So it's how that is in t turn um, represented or manifested in that individual or the, the target. Yeah, I, I guess I just don't understand why power balance is the definition. It seems like it would still be a good definition of bullying without it. Right. But this is a definition de developed by the Department of Education. It's the standard definition that a lot of states and agencies are using. And it's the one that we also identify with in Fairfax County. Yeah, I don't know that. I was just asking for the rationale. So yeah. I could understand it better why that's included. Because bullying is about power intimidation. So it is trying to get someone to feel a certain way someone to be possibly bullied or uh, feel some type of physical harm because it's the intent to cause that harm to that person. Okay. Now, in addition, there's harassment. Offhand or just from the top of your heads, what do you think the difference between harassment or bullying is? Okay. Um, unlike bullying, harassment only has to happen one time for it to be considered harassment. Okay. Harassment often has a specific person or target um, or unspecified person. It only has to happen once. Um, and the intent may not be necessarily to cause harm to that person. So it could be someone is joking and it offends them. And there's like, I, that was not my intent. But however, there is an effect associated with it. And it also creates a hostile work environment. Okay. There are two types or three um, main ones that we often talk about or are familiar with is the sexual or gender based harassment. Um, and then we have discriminatory um, harassment. So where someone um, may be targeted because of their religion or their gender or just their sexual orientation or sexual identity. Um, I think the climate we have become more and understand that sexual harassment is now um, more, I don't want to say more prevalent, but people are starting to focus on it a little more with the Me Too movement um, and just understanding what that means. Um, is it someone flir flirting with another person or is it um, giving someone a compliment and understanding it um, or your interpretation or perspective of it? Um, excuse me. Um, in addition, it's how the person that receives it interprets it is important to know. And I'll often tell individuals or even parents is what determine what was the intent of that comment, that gesture or the um, the action, because that will help determine if this is something that was intentional um, or it was something that was done to maliciously make someone feel a certain way or uncomfortable. OK. Now, these two types of um, issues of bullying and harassment can often be confused with ordinary teasing or mistreatment, conflict, and, or accident or a misunderstanding. So <coughs> as a former English teacher, I remember talking about conflict a lot. Um, and we have conflict versus um, man versus society, man versus man. But we knew that sometimes the issue was just a misunderstanding or people having different perspectives on a certain topic or subject. Um, so it is possible for kids to be in a conflict and it not constitute as bullying because a conflict is usually an isolated incident that is not prolonged. However, if that incident starts to reoccur multiple times, that's when we have to start looking and determining if it is bullying or not. Um, ordinary teasing or mistreatment, sometimes we need to, um, kids are often joking with their friends or making fun at them but it's not necessarily intended to cause them harm or to make them feel uncomfortable or um, not value in their context or in their community. And then sometimes information is just misunderstood or interpreted um, incorrectly. So especially in the 21st century, we have a text culture. So kids will often say something by text, but we're unable to interpret the tone or the context of that message. So sometimes that is just an easy misunderstanding or someone um, may make a joke, but it, the delivery is a little off. So you don't realize that it's a joke sometimes or it's even the context of the conversation. Um, I remember one case where the mother may have thought the mother thought that her son was being bullied by the culture and the language that their kids were using when they were playing online games. Um, so she realized that the kids were not necessarily talking nice to each other, but they, she brought it to the attention of the school and the school says, 
as we look at them, they're after and perfectly okay in schools. There's no power imbalance. No one is trying to harm each other. They are cooperating. They work well with each other. And there's a respect piece. Um, however, it was just in that moment, the culture of that game that they were talking to each other. So that can also be determined or misunderstood. So I have three scenarios. Let's identify which one is mistreatment, bullying, or harassment. The first one reads, Salvatore gives the wrong answer in a class. A bunch of other students laugh and say, you are so stupid. Is that bullying, mistreatment, or harassment? Mistreatment. Why is it mistreatment? Once. Okay. Not happening. I mean, I don't know what's happening if it happens over and over and again, but uh, it's just happening in that circle there. Okay. The student gave a wrong answer and it's funny. Okay. So, in that one instance, it only happened once. In this scenario, do we know if it happened multiple times? No, but in this case, it was only that once. Was it the student's intentions to cause harm to this person? It, it, right. It wasn't necessarily in the response of the kids to cause harm to their person, but the effect of it is what they felt, you know, harmed by what they said. Um, but it wasn't necessarily their intent to do it. Okay. That is mistreatment. Every day when Susan comes to school, a group of older girls whispers about her calling her ugly and tell other students not to sit with her at lunch. Is this mistreatment, bullying or harassment? Bullying. Okay, so why is it bullying? It happens every day. What else? It's intending to cause harm to her, and there's one more thing. There's isolating her, so there's the power what? The power imbalance. Okay, good job. Now, Sasha walks down the hallway in her school one day, and several boys follow her down the hallway telling her she looks hot and keeps touching her on the backside, even when she asks them to stop. For the next week, she begs her parents to let her stay home from school. Bullying, mistreatment, or harassment? Harassment. harassment. And why is that? The unwanted touch. The unwanted touch. Is it just the touch? The, the verbal com comments as well. And she even asks them to what? Stop. To stop. So what can bullying or harassment have um, on academics and in general on, on students? Um, depression and anxiety are often linked to bullying or harassment. Um, and therefore, how that manifested in a classroom could appear differently amongst students. Um, so for some, depression could look like um, being high anxiety or very anxious, whereas in others, it could be withdrawal from class or um, wanting to be isolated from their peers. When these things happen, um, their sleep pattern changes, the way they interact with each other, their eating patterns, um, and also they have a loss of interest. So sometimes when you see a kid that is actively engaged in school, actively engaged in extracurricular activities, and all of a sudden they have a withdrawal from those or a lack of interest, sometimes that is a sign that bullying could be happening, but it also could be a sign that other things around that, could, um, around that child or that student could also be happening. Um, when those things occur, we see that students are not engaged in school because mentally they are checked into what is happening to them all the time. So they're constantly focused on what people are saying or wondering if that student is going to be in school or not. Um, sometimes students are having health complaints. I have a tummy ache or I have headaches or, you know, I feel anxious because their first thing the um, sensor is that need to defend themselves, that fight, flight, or freeze, so they don't know necessarily how to handle those emotions. Um, decrease academic achievement, and that's by way of, I no longer want to be here. I can no longer focus on what's happening. Um, school's just not fun for me anymore because of what's happening in my environment. 
So therefore, if they're not engaged in learning, you're going to see that their grades are decreasing. They're going to see that your SOL scores are possibly going down or just their interest in after school activities such as theater, drama. Um, they're just not interested anymore. So what are some schools doing to prevent bullying? Um, I would say Fairfax County does a great job in educating kids on what bullying is. Um, this is not just a lesson they get one year and they never receive it again. All throughout their educational career, from kindergarten to 12th grade, they are getting some information or education on what is considered bullying, what is considered kind behavior. And even this year, we started incorporating digital citizenship lessons as to how we should conduct ourselves online. Um, in addition, we do have Bullying and Prevention Weeks or Bullying and Prevention Months. October is the National Bullying and Prevention Month. So some schools have started campaigns where they are saying, um, some are like give a high five day, where you're just being kind to people in your own room or taking a pledge not to bully. Um, some schools throughout the week, they do kindness pledges where they are just pledging to be kind to people in their environment. Um, and some of it we um, also talk about is character education. Some schools in the county have now established the Positivity Project, which is focuses on character traits and just helping students identify those positive attributes in their peers and their teachers and people in their community and actually encouraging them to be that way as well. Um, once again, it's still in the health curriculum. And then we have the anti-bullying lessons in the county. So how do schools respond to um, bullying? Every report of bullying is taken seriously in the county. Um, so as a mandated reporter, every teacher, every um, administrator, we have to report any instance where there's a kid who's suspected of being bullied or if a parent um, brings that concern to us. We do a thorough investigation and based on their investigations, we provide support to both the aggressor and the victim or the target. Um, often we say, even if we find that it's not a case of bullying, we still put interventions in place so those individuals are able to mediate or understand or come, come to a resolution in regards to their conflict or their situation. Um, in addition, some schools have anonymous tip lines, but the county has an anonymous tip line and text line that you can utilize. Um, the phone number is 571-423-2020. If you wanna send a text message, you can send it to 571-418-6870. So if there's a case of bullying, <clears throat> excuse me, it is reported back. Um, we do keep a record of the incidents. Yes. How many complaints of bullying would you say Fairfax County gets in the past four years? I do not have that number because it's based on pyramids in schools, but I don't have it. But if you want to look, you can actually look at the youth survey data that just came out for the 2017, 2018 year. Um, and that's where the students actually self-report as to what is happening, what they're being exposed to, and things of that nature. Yes? What is the county procedure if a school is not handling bullying properly? Okay. So remember that if there is a case where you believe bullying is not being handled appropriately, um, the question is, who has already been in contact? So if it's, an, let's say, an assistant principal, then go to that principal in regarding that incident. Um, and if it's not handled at the school level, you do have the opportunity to go to your executive principals and up the hierarchy as well and bring it to their attention. Yes, the number, these numbers are provided to students. It's just how the schools get that information out to them. So each school has a different way of providing that information. Any other questions? Okay. So how can parents prevent bullying? Um, first one is keep the lines of communication open. Um, just in this capacity, it's just important to remember that we are just listening to our students and, under, and our kids and understanding their viewpoint and their perspectives. Um, I'm often reminded that we may see things a lot differently than they see it. So making sure we're looking at all aspects of it, but making sure they still feel safe and um, 
comfortable sharing that information with us. Um, still encourage kids to do what they love, fostering so um, pro-social engagement. Um, and I remind kids today, because when I talk to kids about cyberbullying, um, I remind them that the biggest way we learn is through play and interaction. So if we're on the playground, we learn that some of our comments could make someone feel a certain way, or if we do something else, it could possibly offend them. Um, however, when we're texting, we can't always read into the emotion or that response that a person has. So just making sure we encourage our kids to participate outside of social media, um, participate in activities where they are engaging and learning from others, um, and then just once again, we hone in on what we expect as parents um, and the behaviors that we expect that we carry out. And then also model kindness, respect, and healthy conflict resolution. Um, by science, the brain isn't fully developed until age 25. So our kids, we would love to say they're gonna make the perfect decision every single time. Scientifically, that's not gonna happen. Um, so it's important that we actually teach our kids decision-making skills. And I'll often say, thinking through the process. Um, if you ask a kid why they do something, the common answer is, I don't know. And sometimes they really don't know why they did something. Um, so making sure we just hone on the, what those decision-making skills is. What is expected of them? Um, how can they handle situations differently? And I often say, take instances from the real world. If you hear about something on the news, sit down with them, have a conversation. How would you handle this situation? Or how could this be handled differently? Or ask them, if it's not you, have you seen this happening in your schools or in your community or even on your sports or athletics teams? Um, so they can engage in the conversations. Okay. How can parents respond? It's just know the warning signs of bullying. Um, and sometimes bullying doesn't happen at school, but it's happening in their community or in their neighborhood. I will always say the best thing I always appreciate it is when a parent allowed me to know that there was a conflict happening somewhere else. So when it came time to the classroom, I can see if those behaviors were the same or being manifested in some way. Um, especially with, um, I guess, social media and this piece, because kids have a sense that because it didn't happen at school, they can't get a consequence for it in the school building. Um, and it actually goes back to the days of MySpace. Do you remember MySpace? Um, where there was a group of kids who created a page about um, a young lady saying mean and vulgar things. <coughs> she found out about it at school. It was manifested in the school. The school suspended these individuals. Um, and then it ended up going to court. And the court ruled, um, the parents didn't agree with that suspension. The court ruled that if it causes a foreseeable disruption to the learning environment, the school has the right to step in and um, do an investigation and assign a consequence. So if it's impacting that kid's academics, then the school has the ability to step in. Or if it's used on your FCPS issue technology, the school has the right to step in. And understanding that on school time means on school technology, on Google Apps for Education, on Blackboard, how they use these are always gonna be important for them as well, okay? Um, and reach out to others um, for support as needed. So if you just wanna talk about it, just say, I think this is happening, how can I handle this situ situation? That is always appreciated um, from all of us. In regards to internet safety, um, how many of you know the popular apps that kids are using today? <laughs> All right, so is Snapchat one of them? Instagram, Roblox, that's a new one. Um, and every time I have this conversation, I realize there's a different one that I did not know about. Um, and then there's another one that just came out. House Party. House Party, which is the video group chat. Yeah, it's like FaceTiming and everyone's in your house, so you can accept them. Right. So, be mindful of how they're using social media uh, because there are a lot of, as I say, social media apps, but there's also a lot of third party messaging apps. So if your kids have, let's say Verizon, I know that I can check my text messages from any device. However, if they have a third party messaging app, you can't always check those messages, such as WhatsApp or GroupMe. Um, so they could be um, associated with something on that messaging that you're not aware of. Um, Snapchat, um, 
it sells the idea to kids that things disappear. Um, however, after 24 hours, you know, it could still be there because it doesn't prevent someone from taking a what? A screenshot or just simply standing beside someone and showing them that information or that con content. Um, and plus, all that information is saved on their server because you essentially give them permission to use it for market research. Um, make sure you set those parental controls. Um, I know a lot of cable companies or Internet providers are making it easier to set parameters. I know with Xfinity and I think with Verizon Fios, you can actually pause the Internet now. Um, and there's a lot of monitoring software that you can use, which are antivirus um, programs. Set ground rules and expectations. This is very important. Be consistent with your expectations. Um, if you say you're going to check their phone every week, check their phone every week. Um, I often remind kids that having a phone is a privilege, not a right. Um, so guess what? Mom and dad has the authority to check those apps or those messages at all times. Friend and follow them. They may, they may not accept, but then you just take their phones and accept it for them. Um, and hopefully they won't go in and block you. Um, but just follow. Make sure it's clear what they do. Uh, explore, share, and celebrate. What I know about kids is that they have their own culture when it comes to social media. So they have their own set of rules. And it's not necessarily the rules that we have for social media. Um, there was an article last year that came out about posting photos. Um, and it said that young girls, <coughs> their culture for social media said they would not post photos of themselves in a bathing suit if, unless it was from the head up. Or if they were in a group of girls, it was then okay to post the photos of themselves in their bathing suits. So they have some type of subculture that we're not aware of when it comes to social media and how things are in their world deemed appropriate or not appropriate. Okay? And then be a good digital role model. So also, remember we heard the phrase learning by example. Um, just to make sure we're setting the tone. How are we using social media? Are we saying negative things about people? Are they picking up those behaviors as well? Or are they uplifting people? Okay. So, are there any questions that you guys may have in regards to social media, bullying, group chats? I just thought of another chat one. It's uh, Discord. That is a new one. Okay, Discord. And then what is the purpose of Discord? It's a gamer chat. Okay. Oh, I just want to share that you say that sometimes there's misinterpretation between how people see the people that are experiencing. Like, so for example, uh, in the middle school where my son goes to, whoever has a birthday, all the boys get to punch the birthday boy. Mm -hmm. So my son arrived on his birthday full of bruises all over there. And of course, there's some kids who will beat him hard. He said, this, we do that to everybody. He hurt, I didn't like it, but I can't do anything. I'm like, this is not okay. Mm -hmm. But this is our culture in the in the middle school. So is that bullying? Is that what, what is this? Right. And here's the thing, as I remember growing up and if someone said your birthday lit for however old you were, you know, so but is it acceptable? Is the question. And that's the conversation that you have. To inflict any type of bodily harm where that person is being bruised, in my opinion, would not be acceptable. However, we understand that this is something that they have worked in their minds that is acceptable. So it's making sure we have those conversations and interpret how that could possibly cause harm to people, even though something can be acceptable in their environment. I know it's, it's, a, it's a balance, right? It is, it is because he wasn't happy. He didn't like it. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was upset, yeah. but he, he couldn't show it because he's, he had to accept it. You know right. what I mean? And, and what I say kids is that they don't necessarily have to accept anything. And I always tell kids that their voice is the most powerful tool that they can utilize. If this is something that they were not comfortable with, they need to utilize their voice and say, I'm not comfortable with this, even though I may understand this is something that you traditionally do. And I say the word is um, boundaries. We teach people how to treat us. Um, so making sure that we are communicating like, this may be with you, what you guys do. However, in my world, this is not acceptable. And it's okay to <laughs> set those boundaries because people have to what? They have to respect them. Um, and if you communicate, 
um, that it's not happening, that's when we start that it, if you communicate and it continues to happen, this is when we're going to go into the lines of what bullying, harassment, um, and just sometimes it's just mistreatment. Okay. Did you have, okay. Any other questions? Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. How do we help her? Um, like, I've just been telling her, I'm like, well, she's gone now, and I've told her, I said, that's not a very good friend because a friend should be encouraging you and make, not making you feel bad. So right. How do we help her through this? It's going to be difficult. Um, and what I've, my first thing I always say is positive affirmations, okay? So if you didn't hear it, the scenario is that she has a seven year old daughter or a seventh grade daughter? seven-year-old daughter and her friend constantly tells her or this young lady at school constantly tells her that she's not pretty she doesn't have a good singing voice things of that nature um positive affirmations are always a great way to start where your kids are just being hearing these things from themselves i am beautiful i am smart i am talented just something that they continuously tell themselves um, so that they are constantly hear it on a daily basis in addition you also re-emphasize that information or that content. Um, have you brought it to the attention of the school that this is happening in the school environment? No, because it happened last year. We, we moved. Okay. School, and that was one of the reasons that we did. Okay. Um, okay. Help her be in an area where there are other. Okay. And I'll also say, since you moved schools, just make that counselor aware of what has happened the previous year so that counselor can actually come in and work with that student maybe on some coping skills and different mechanisms that they can use as well. Yes. We can have like a similar situation where it happened like when she was in elementary school but now she moved away to middle school so we brought it up to the teacher's attention so they were kind of like separate from working together in the group because uh, that person was also our neighbor making mm -hmm. comments like that or trying to completely act differently during the school environment like Mm -hmm. And even now being in middle school, you know, like she kind of like surrounded herself with kids or like the girls similar to her personality. And I believe that's a really like a big struggle for us as parents to overcome those things that, you know, like later in their life have been kind of like, you know, like the person is very sensitive. It's very hard to kind of like re redo that. And, right. You know, show your kid that that's not true. Right. So it, it is hard to retrain them from thinking things um but it's also not impossible it's also it's just once again going back to the self-esteem the re affirmations making sure that it's consistent um seeking support when needed and also maybe and what i've always told kids is that it's important to communicate so once any situation comes up where you feel that you may have self-doubt Communicate that to your parents. Say, this is how I'm feeling today, and I don't want to feel this way. Um, just so you can have the opportunity to process that and to walk through it. And once again, it gives you that opportunity to reaffirm. Or allow them opportunities to find a different group of friends or a different environment. What is something else that could possibly take them away from focusing on that particular incident or that group of friends? Um, and I remind kids is that for them, sometimes school is a social environment. And that's why that social power is important because the more friends you have, the more popular you perceive yourself to be, right? Um, and that's also the same thing concept with social media. The more friends you have on, what well, kids don't use Facebook. Um, the more followers you have on Snapchat or Instagram, the more popular you're perceived to be. Um, it's understanding that it's not about friends, it's about you being comfortable with yourself, you're setting your boundaries, your expectations, but that's hard for kids to do um, because they're just not at that capacity yet. 
Um, and I always say, it's okay to have a conflict with someone, but it's never okay for that person to disrespect you. So it's always back to communicating what is respectful, communicating what you expect of your friends. And also setting those boundaries again. You know, if you have people who engage in a particular behavior that your parents deem not appropriate, or even if you deem not appropriate, is segmenting yourself away from them. And understanding that popularity isn't about the number of friends you have, it's about you being just the best you and people gravitating towards you because you're just a genuine and good person. So it's, once again, repeating, repeating the same message. Because they will get it, it's just sometimes hard and difficult. Yes? I had a situation a couple of years ago when my daughter was being bullied by one of her friends. Um, at the beginning, I, I mean, and I knew that the mom, and because they used to play together, so I was in a hard situation because uh, that lady, that little girl, was repeatedly doing the things back to my daughter. My daughter was telling me, and one time I got sick because I didn't say anything to, to the mom. So I said, okay, let me just stop this now. I sent an email to the teacher and said, hey, can you please help me with this? She has been suffering these situations all over this time, and I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. So the next day, they got the, the girls together with a counselor, and of course, apparently, of course, the, the little one, I told her mom, and then her mom texted me, and then she said, you shouldn't be, next time please talk to me instead of the counselor, or instead of the teacher. I don't know if that was really a good thing to do. I mean, to me, I felt bad because I also said, well, I could say it to her mom, but that was, I was thinking, okay, this is gonna happen, this is gonna go away, but it didn't go away. So, on cases like this, it's your comfort level. Who are you comfortable talking to first? And the question is, as who do you communicate to in regards to a situation? It's whoever you are comfortable with first. Um, so that may be the teacher because you have that relationship. It may be the counselor or it may be the administrator. Um, but I will say as a parent, don't be afraid to have that conversation with another parent. Um, but also, I've always said this, my parents, I can give them credit, they did a really good job with communicating the expectations of my friends every time they came into my household, into my environment. Is this is what I expect of you, this is what I expect of my child, and re-emphasizing that information. Um, so making sure that the people that you interact with, or the kids that they interact with saying, in my household, this behavior is not acceptable. Or this is what I expect of the children that my kids you know, um, are around. And also just communicating that back to the parent. Because the parent may not have known because your child was the one, I guess, I don't wanna, who was being inflicted at that time. They may have interpreted it as something different or just them playing around or joking around um, in that case. But it's whoever you are comfortable with as long as it's being communicated and addressed. So don't ever feel bad about contacting another parent in regards to a behavior or something that alarms you about the kid or situation. We had a situation several years ago where um, my fifth grade son was being harassed on a regular basis and bullied by this other little boy. And he is, has a naturally forgiving nature and he would forgive him over and over mm -hmm. again and say you know, that he would continue to be his friend. He kept giving him chance after chance and finally it got to the point where, you know, he was being kicked, he was being hit, he was being pushed and shoved into the wall and, um, and he was very manipulative in his tactics where he would do all of these things where it put my son in a position where it looked like he was the one that was doing something wrong mm -hmm. right when the teacher would turn around. So my son was, in, he was the victim, but he was the one that was getting in trouble constantly for these things. He decided to write this little boy a very thoughtful letter just saying, you know, I've, I've tried to be your friend, I've tried to do the right thing, but, you know, I, I can't continue to allow myself to be put in this situation over and over again. And I got a nasty, nasty call from his mom saying that my son was the nasty one. He was the one that was doing everything wrong mm -hmm. and um, you know it just really became apparent that 
nothing was going to resolve in that situation, and the other little boy ended up having to be removed from my son's classroom. Right. And, and expelled, potentially. Yeah. And that reminds me that if there's a situation where there is no resolve, there is an opportunity through our office to do what we call a restorative justice circles, where we bring the aggressor and the target together. Um, and we discuss how their actions impact others. And it's the mediated circle, so we come to a resolution and like a working agreement on how this can not happen again or what we can do to right our wrongs. Um, so that is always an opportunity for schools to use because sometimes the situations are so severe that even if the kid is suspended, it's, the situation isn't necessarily going to be resolved. So that is always an opportunity um, in regards to where people are coming together. The parents can partic um, participate in that circle, and you can, can be able to express how um, that parent's response made you feel, or how did your kid respond to what was happening um, to that situation. Okay. Yes? So they're both, how does FCPS handle special education? Yes, are, they, like, are they some exceptions? Is there, I know it has to be case by case basis, but do you guys have like a model that you go um, by? The best way to answer that is, I'm going to believe, is that when we look at um, bullying, we're looking at the incident and the behaviors that occur. So if this is a case that's going to result in a suspension, sometimes um, you can also bring in what we call your procedural support liaison. Uh, for which are PSLs, who can help mediate that situation or come to an agreement. Uh, but sometimes if there's, let's say, a 10-day suspension that's going to happen, they have what they call a manifestation determination review, where they determine if that behavior is a direct, is causal, meaning their because of their disability, this action occurred. Um, however, they are very clear to distinguish between intent and something as being this is their disability and this is why it's happened. So they go through the investigation, they look at what the possible disability is and then determine what is the best outcome gonna be. So, but everything is documented. And usually on cases like that, they do seek out, um, not necessarily out of school support, but that those procedural support liaisons to walk through that to determine if it's best or what is best. Did I answer your question? I think so. I just have a couple of scenarios in my head and Something very similar happened to us as well. With the, I reached out to a parent, and they came back and they said, "Hey, my kid. This. I mean, my kid was like kind of a bystander. Mm -hmm. The parent, because my kid was there, and he told what happened. The parent came and uh, blamed him, like, oh, your kid is not sane, and this and that.' So, um, I just, I kind of want to know exactly how is it if one kid punches another." right, and the kid with special needs is the one being punched by punch back, how is that handled? Because technically both of those kids would be suspended. Right. Right. So I guess what I would want to know is, like, what, what exceptions are there, like, what usually happens? It's a case-by-case -case scenario. Um, and according to the SNR, the principals have the right to determine what is that best discipline consequence for that kid. So, but once again, it goes back to the thorough investigation, making sure we just don't have he say, she say, and just understanding the true reason as to what, why the things occurred the way they did. Okay. Okay. If there are any more questions, these are some of the website resources that you guys can use. Um, if you go to fcps.edu and just type in bullying, cyberbullying, it will actually come up with a list of resources for you as well, or just how the county handles um, resources. Stopbullying.gov is a great resource to find additional information on bullying, cyberbullying, um, and some of the effects of these and how they're manifested in school or in your child. Um, you can always reach out to my office, Student Safety and Wellness, and they will be able to provide you with additional information or um, content. Okay, are there any questions? All right, thank you guys for coming out tonight. I hope I didn't hold you too long. <laughs> Thank you.